Well, ladies and gentlemen, the reading today uh, continues our series in Luke chapters 1 to 2, Christmas Basics, and today's reading is Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 38. We'll turn to that in a moment, and you can follow along in your Bibles at home or on the text on the screen. Now, how do you react when something amazing outside your experience, beyond what you think is reasonable or normal, how do you react when something like that takes place? Some people, especially those who have not seen the event, will dismiss it as impossible. Others will look at it, accept that it might have happened, then dismiss it as, that's an accident or what a fluke. Add into that mix the fact that such an event happened centuries before you live in a part of the world you've never visited, in a culture that you've never experienced, what would you say? Would it still be relevant? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for Luke, a doctor who investigated the life and times of Jesus. I thank you for Theophilus, the man for whom Luke wrote, a man who seems to have heard the truth about Jesus, trusted in it, and was saying to doubt. Father, as we read this history, please apply it to our lives, reassuring us of the certainty of the truths about Jesus. Amen. Well, Theophilus is doubting the truth of what he's been taught about Jesus, whether because of social pressures, family pressures, community pressures, work pressures, who knows. Uh, He, a Roman official, is starting to doubt the truth about Jesus. Luke, a doctor and companion of the Apostle Paul, investigates a stack of eyewitness accounts, compiles a fairly straightforward history of the life and times of Jesus to reassure Theophilus that he has been taught the truth about Jesus and that it can certainly be trusted. And Luke starts at the beginning. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive Both of them were well along in years. When his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to burn incense. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You'll name him John. There will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he'll be great in the sight of the Lord, will never drink wine or beer. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He'll turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. He'll go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous, to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. How can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel. For I'm an old man, my wife is well along in years. Well, the angel answered him, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen. You'll become silent and unable to speak until these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he would not speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept making signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept himself in ice, kept herself in its seclusion for five months. She said, The Lord has done this for me. He's looked with favour in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favoured woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you've found favour with God. Now listen, you'll conceive and give birth to a son, 
He'll call his name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be since I've not been intimate with a man? And the angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. Consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. This is a sixth month for her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. I'm the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That point two on the outline, uh, Luke does as he said he would. He begins with the very first. He starts with the births of two boys. Well, he actually starts a little earlier than that, doesn't he? He starts with the prediction of the births of the two boys. If you take a bird's eye view here, uh, there are two birth narratives and Luke lays them out and then intertwines them. We'll come to that in a moment. They each mirror the other. We meet the characters, the scene set. An angel appears, Gabriel in both cases, speaks to them. There are questions, there's an aftermath, and there's a fulfilment in at least one instance. There is a lot here. I mean, we could look at this from the obvious angle of one of God's people at the time dealing with the fact that God's promises do nothing except gather dust. Or we could draw out themes and ideas that a Roman public office holder might find encouraging, even confronting. Or we could deal with the threads that weave their way back into the Old Testament. All would be profitable. But today I want to make four simple observations, four observations that draw out some big key ideas that will reassure us about the truth we've been taught about Jesus. Observation number one, and I'm at point three on the outline, Luke actually does what he says he would. He writes good history, carefully examined history. Are we given a time frame? This is during the time of King Herod's rule in Judea, sometime towards the end of the period, 37 to 4 BC. We're given a location, Judea, Jerusalem, and the hill country that surrounds it. We're given characters that are verifiable at that time. And there's a priest who serves in a certain division, Abijah, at a certain time. At the time we're in is probably the pinnacle of his priestly career. Being chosen by Lot to burn incense in the sanctuary was a once in your life as a priest occasion. I put it on the pool room wall kind of certificate. There would have been records that could be checked. We have his wife's name, her background. We're given their details so that we know that this is that Zechariah and Elizabeth, the old ones, the righteous ones, the barren ones. We have a cloud of witnesses, the whole assembly of the people that can be interviewed. We're given details that speak of investigation by Luke with Zechariah and Elizabeth, a one-on-one chat with an angel. Tell me, Zechariah, where was he standing? Oh, to the right of the altar of incense. We're given the account of the angel, the reaction of Zechariah. Hardly an edifying reaction from a priest who doubted God whom he'd prayed to. We're given the time frame for the pregnancy of Elizabeth when Zechariah had finished his priestly duties and went home. And then further time frames. Months later, the second birth prediction. Again, we're given location, names, lineage, time frame. Uh, we're given the town and the place. We're given details so that we know that it's the Joseph descended from David who was engaged to be married to Mary, who is the relative of Elizabeth. Given details that only an investigation and interview by Luke could turn up. Hey, Luke, I, I was disturbed by this and I thought about it in my heart. It all smacks of good history, history that Theophilus could investigate and examine. After all, he had all the skills and resources of the Roman public service at his disposal. Observation two, parallelism. Luke's given us an orderly and historical account, but we've got to remember he's got a bias. These are events that are fulfilment, God's plans being brought to fruition. And so Luke has written this as parallel birth predictions. We're meant to read them side by side. Compare the announcements of John and Jesus being born. There are many similarities. There's significant natural impediments. There's Gabriel. There's announcements following the same pattern. There's similar reactions. But there are significant differences, aren't there? The baby to be called John will operate as a prophet 
He comes from a family of priests. A prophet is a mouthpiece for God. Both these Old Testament officers, a prophet and priest, are about preparing God's people, getting them ready for God. The baby to be called Jesus, however, will be a king. He's descended from the family of David. Very different kettle of fish. He's the long-awaited for promised saviour of the people of God, or he seems to be. Zechariah and Elizabeth suffer from being barren. Barren, godly, elderly families in the Bible, pretty significant. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, the, the family of Samuel. Mary, that's a very different kettle of fish, isn't it? A teenage, young virgin. That is something out of left field. Both boys are special. Well, any birth is special, isn't it? These births certainly are. But like anyone else born on the same day as George, the Prince of Cambridge, one is more special than the other. One will serve the other. John will serve Jesus, preparing the way for the coming of God's Saviour. Luke writes so that we see that comparison in parallel, but also so we pick up the third observation, which is all about fulfilment. As Luke recounts the words of Gabriel, first to Zechariah, then to Mary, we've got to notice the emphasis on fulfilment. I mean, that's Luke's bias, isn't it? Like Gabriel's words to Zechariah about John, well, he's directly quoting the last prophet in our version of the Old Testament, Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Look, I'm going to send to you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He'll turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I'll come and strike the land with a curse. God's made a promise. And then he's made a promise to prepare people for the coming of the promise. And John is going to do that job, to prepare people. So when we turn to the next announcement, we should not be surprised when the baby Jesus is surrounded by even bigger fulfilment promises. Just read them later on in Luke chapter 1, 26 to 33. He's going to be born of a virgin, like Isaiah 7 says. He's going to be born to the family of David and will rule on David's throne, like 2 Samuel 7 says. He'll be the son of God, like 2 Samuel 7 and Isaiah 9 say. He'll rule from, he'll rule all of Judah, like Isaiah, uh, Genesis 49 says. His kingdom and rule will never end, like Isaiah 9 say. He'll be the son of God enthroned over everything, like Psalm 2 says. And the order's important. The preparer comes first and hot on the heels comes the Son of God, just like Malachi says. The preparer, preparing the way for God, he'll follow hot on his footsteps. Which brings us to observation number four. The focus is on God. Both Zechariah and Mary have significant issues with the announcements they receive and their doubts though are different. Zechariah is rightly judged for his. After all, he'd prayed and asked He's a man steeped in the Old Testament, marinated in his promises, given the job of leading God's people to trust God to do as he promised. So why should he then doubt when it comes and smacks him in the face? Well, he asked for a sign he should have known better. Mary, on the other hand, doesn't doubt the fact of the matter, does she? She asks a reasonable question in the context of God's revelation about the morality of the matter. Mary asks for reassurance, given her obvious fear of accusation and social isolation. Moreover, whereas God delivering babies to barren women was part of the Old Testament fabric, virgins giving birth to babies, well, that was out of the field, wasn't it? Gabriel's response to Mary is, I think, at the heart of Luke's account. It's at the heart of reassuring Theophilus and us that what we've received from Luke is certain and the truth. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 37 for nothing will be impossible with God. All the historical facts here, the, the facts that Theophilus could go and verify, focus on humans. But the most significant actor on the stage of this drama is God. It's his action that brings both conceptions about. It's his messenger who delivers the news. It's his promises that stand behind both babies. It's his commitment to send a messenger to prepare the people of God for the coming of God. There is no doubt that whilst the human actors can be investigated, this is an account of God's action in and through them. And it's not impossible. It just needs God to act. 
or faced by something that seems too outrageous, something too hard to explain, something too beyond what I expect possible or even deem reasonable, my default position, your default position perhaps, is oh, impossible, fluke, accident. Now, such a response is understandable, but it doesn't deal truthfully or transparently or honestly with what we've got in front of us today. Remember those four observations, good history, parallel accounts to draw differences out, fulfillment, the focus on God. Luke has written such an account that we cannot deny its truth. We cannot dismiss it as accident, fluke or impossible. It's written on the pages of history, pages that a man like Theophilus could investigate, could question, could check, could examine. I mean, the, the, the normal assumption would be if it's not true, he would have binned it, but he didn't bin it, so it must be. Well, it's good history, isn't it? Now, we might not be able to do what Theophilus did, but the facts remain. God has acted in real time and space, in real dirt and dust, in real people. God has acted to do exactly as he promised to come into the world to deal with its brokenness. Nothing random, nothing abstract, nothing accidental here. Now, if we can't dismiss it, if we can't deride it, if we can't doubt it, we have to decide what to do with it, how to respond to it. Now, one response might be to persist in dismissing it, maybe even describing it as a social myth which has been dredged up in order to justify an abiding social tradition that builds up families and communities and allows them to show generosity and hospitality. Put simply, a myth that allows us to have Christmas. Well, on one level I can understand that, but it doesn't deal with what we've just seen. This is good history, showing what God has fulfilled. Whilst such a response is understandable, I want to suggest that it's really untenable in the long term. A second response might be that of Zechariah. He was a man, as we've said, steeped in the promises of God, but confronted by them rolling out, he just couldn't grasp how that was possible. So when they do start to unfold, he can't work out quite what to do with them. I suspect that there are many in our community, perhaps even here today, who are like Zechariah initially. They ascend to the truth, but they just don't know or even understand how to apply such a truth in its possibilities. Well, a third response is the one that Luke is aiming for, the right response, if you like, to be assured that what you've been taught about Jesus is true and certain. I, I think Mary probably sits in that camp. She knows the truth and she submits to it. If this is true, and if God really has done this in time and space, and he has, then the truths to be applied to us are significant. God does as he promises. God has intervened in this world to deal with its brokenness, our sin. God has seen the king of the whole universe, sent this king of the whole universe and all time to live amongst us. God has prepared humans for this moment. We celebrate Christmas every year, don't we? Each year with monotonous regularity. We hear these accounts with monotonous regularity. I suppose the simple question is, which of those reactions are you? Is it a myth to justify a social gathering that brings nice feelings? Is it something where you just can't join the two and so you can say yes over here but don't know what it looks like down here? Or do you actually go, it's true and I submit to it. I, I know God has actually done this. Let me ask you to think about how you respond to these birth predictions and what they are saying about history, about Jesus, about God, about his promises, about you. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that Luke wrote it. Thank you for the great goodness of the historical certainty we see here. Father, please give us time and the heart and mind to think about our reaction to us. Help us to know the certainty of these events. Amen.